You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis and my trusty service dog, Whistle. And we're thrilled that you're with us today to talk about our favorite subject, working dogs and working animals. And today our guest is Carolyn Clark Beadle. And Carolyn is the Executive Director of Assistance Dogs of the West. And Assistance Dogs of the West is an awesome service dog program in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And they have some really cool and innovative ways that they train their dogs and how they use young people to train their dogs. And she's going to be with us today to talk about all these exciting things. So we're going to take a quick message from our sponsors, and we'll be right back with Carolyn to talk about Assistance Dogs of the West. So please come back and join us. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Be sure to tune in when Pet Life Radio goes live from Global Pet Expo, the world's largest annual pet products trade show. March 25th through the 27th, you can catch all the new products coming out for our pets before they even hit store shelves. From the latest in all-natural and eco-friendly products to the most elegant in pet pampering and high-tech innovations from companies all over the globe. It's at Global Pet Expo. Nearly 800 companies will be displaying new and exciting products to make time with our pets even better. Tune in March 25th through the 27th for everything Global Pet Expo. It's time for school for you and your friends, your furry best friends. Train your dog the fun and easy way with Teacher's Pet Sessions. Teacher's Pet host, Pia Silvani, teaches you step-by-step how to train your dog the fun and easy way. You get eight 30-minute live audio training sessions, complete transcripts of each session, plus a basic training manual to get you and your dog off to a great start. Training begins the moment you bring your dog home. Teacher's Pet Sessions offers positive reinforcement training to shape your dog's behavior and encourages upbeat, enthusiastic responses to ensure that your dog will enjoy learning. Teacher's Pet Sessions dog training is fun at both ends of the leash. So listen, learn, and laugh with your dog with Teacher's Pet Sessions. Get your copy of Teacher's Pet Sessions Volume 1 today. To order, go to TeachersPetSessions.com. Hi, this is Pia Salvani, your host. Bring your dog, tug toy, and treats, and get ready to have some fun. TeachersPetSessions.com. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. I'd like to welcome our guest today, Carolyn Clark Beadle, to Working Like Dogs. Hello, Carolyn, and thanks for joining us. Marcy, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Well, we're so excited that you could join us and tell us about all the cool things that are going on with Assistance Dogs of the West. Well, where do you want to start? First, tell us, how did Assistance Dogs of the West get started? Well, uh, in 1995, so we're in our 15th year and we're really excited about that, our founder, Jill Felice, who came from a very uh, pet-oriented, loving family and had a sister with cerebral palsy, 
um, she decided that she had always known that animals and humans together could create great teams and, and both provide um, wonderful relationships for each other by virtue of the fact that she had trained some of her family dogs to help her sister in the wheelchair. So she decided that she was going to found an organization. And in order to do that, she went to school for, at the um, what is now called the Assistance Dog Institute. But it actually started out as a, an offshoot of Canine Companions for Independence. And Dr. Bonnie Bergen, who is an amazing uh, intuitive educator and animal worker, had started this organization, putting together people who were interested in training dogs to work with people with disabilities uh, in a, in a uh, learning environment. Jill was in the first class with Dr. Bonnie Bergen, and she came back to Santa Fe and started Assistance Dogs of the West with one dog and one client and herself. That turned into, she knew from studying with um, Dr. Bergen that um, they could work with students because Dr. Bergen worked in the uh, juvenile detention center in Santa Rosa, California, teaching some of the kids that, that were juvenile detainees how to help her train the service dogs. So Jill approached an organization, a school here in Santa Fe, Santa Fe Prep, and she got a student class involved with her. Uh, and that was the beginning of this incredible organization which has grown to work in 18 different educational and vocational institutions. We teach about 250 students each year how to help us train service dogs. Wow, 250 each year, that's amazing. One of the real amazing things that we're very, very proud of is the fact that Assistance Dogs of the West, as a, it's kind of a small to middling service dog training agency. We have the largest educational program of any uh, service dog training agency in the United States. Wow, that is so impressive. I know because I live, Whistle and I live in Santa Fe and we're just always so impressed when we see the students out working the dogs and when we've read so much about you guys in the paper and all the different things that you're doing with students and also young people with disabilities. I saw something that on the Today Show that you guys were doing in Albuquerque. Yeah, actually, we started a program working with student trainers. So once again, these are um, young people who are learning to help us train the service dogs. But we have an occupational therapist who is part of our program, uh, a woman who's really, really wonderful named Melissa Winkle. And she has a practice down in Albuquerque. And she it's actually kind of an interesting story the way that it all worked out. She approached a number of different service dog training agencies because she wanted to get a service dog to use in her practice. So that would be kind of what we call in the, in the um, industry a facility dog because it was actually going to work with the therapist. That would be the handler in the practice. And she worked with lots of uh, young people with developmental and cognitive disabilities. So she approached a number of different agencies and nobody would give her a dog because at the time, and this was perhaps almost 10 years ago, people felt that were training service dogs felt that they should go to people with disabilities and not to you know, a therapist. And so when she came to Assistance Dogs of the West, we said, well, you know, that kind of makes sense. She'd be helping a lot of people with disabilities using this dog. So we placed a dog with her. As a uh, result of that placement, she recognized the fact that the dog and the kids with disabilities were really achieving great vocational goals, therapeutic goals. So she came to us and said, hey, I work at this larger organization, Adelante, it, that works with lots of people with developmental disabilities. Would you be interested in, in doing a student training program there? And the, the student trainers would be the clients of that particular practice with developmental disabilities. So we said once again, sure, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so that started a program. We now we unfortunately don't, don't work with Adelante any longer just because of uh, you know, logistics, but we have about four different programs with uh, student trainers who have developmental disabilities, including here in Santa Fe, the Capitol High School Special Ed Group. And they take the bus every Wednesday up to our office, and about 10 student trainers work with our dogs. And the, what they get out of it is it's totally amazing and wonderful to watch because you just get, we hear, we get re reports, of course, from the um, teachers and from the therapists that are involved with each one of these groups. But they will tell us that, you know, people who are nonverbal begin to speak uh, because what they want to do, the, you, as you well know, that relationship with the animal is so unconditionally supportive and, and accepting that it makes it very easy to 
make advances in areas that uh, might, the students might have been challenged in previously. I just think it's the coolest thing to have people with disabilities training the dogs to help people with disabilities. It's, it's just uh, yeah. such a win-win. That's so awesome. It totally is, and, and thank you for you know being as enthusiastic because it really we get so excited about those things, and they're you know they're very small things in in the big scheme of the world, but they're so huge in each one of those lives that you just kind of go wow. The other thing that I would tell you, and once again because it's the dog, you know we like focusing on the dogs as well, is that our dogs, by virtue of working with all these different kinds of student trainers, our dogs are in the program for almost two years. It takes about that long to get train them to the basic 90 commands that they're going to learn. And then when they are matched with their human partner, uh, depending on what the person's challenges and needs are, we finish the dog to meet specific needs of each of the individual uh, human partners. So since our dogs are working with young people who our youngest student trainers are eight years old um, they work with you know people with developmental disabilities so and physical disabilities so they're learning through their entire working or training life how to work with people that have you know voice challenges or physical challenges or are in wheelchairs so when they come to the placement process and they're interviewing with potential human partners they already are acclimated to lots of different types of being and lots of different types of ability. Therefore, it, we have a, a much higher success rate than many organizations just because of this model that we use. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It, it teaches the dogs, like you were saying, not only the commands that they need to know, but it's exposing them to so many different types of, of abilities and disabilities. So that is so cool and making the dog much more versatile in the end, which is really, really awesome. So how do you select the students to participate? Do they have to have a certain ability level in order to participate? And tell us more about the kinds of things that they do with the dogs. Okay. I would start by saying we have, so we have a core curriculum that we have used over the 15 years, and that's for the, I'm going to say mainstream students, because it started with really an in-school program. Um, and, and how do students participate in, in general, they self-select. So in some classes, if it's an in-school or in a juvenile detention center, for example, um, students will write essays and say, this is what I want to do, and this is my experience with, you know, my, any of my history with having a pet or working with a dog or, you know, whatever it, my animal um, history is. And, and we're looking for, we want to make sure that students really are interested because um, it's such a... Um, it's such a, um, what's the right word? There's a lot of discipline that the student trainers must, you know, kind of uh, maintain. And it, there's patience and there's tolerance. And we do um, pre-class uh, kind of like social inventory surveys, ask, you know, how do you feel about this, that, and the other thing? Because what we're looking for is then at the end of the class, have you, you know, learned a, more about or have you increased your skills in communications, in leadership, in, you know, tolerance? There are skills and attributes that we're kind of looking for. Um, so, and, and then what I said the youngest student trainer is eight years old. We have over time recognized the fact that eight, year, eight years old in, um, in, child development is about where kids get a level of assertiveness that they can use effectively in working with training dogs. So that, you know, they have to have, um, we laugh and say, you know, you have to have your, um, your leader voice. And if um, children younger than that aren't necessarily to that, um, to that place yet. So eight years old is once again, that would be kind of an age thing. Um, if, children, so if, if kids or young adults have uh, developmental disabilities, we do have a, a set of um, abilities that we look for. Uh, and also, when I said the kind of attributes, you're looking for, um, for patience and for um, ability to be consistent. And sometimes that is a challenge with, in some of our student trainers with developmental disabilities. Now, when you ask about you know, what do they do with the dogs? Uh, a, a standard class, which is, you know, just wonderful to watch because it happens in each one of those student populations, and sometimes it looks different depending on who the, the population is. But they start with, um, there's like a five-minute information lecture. 
in each one of the classes, regardless of whether they're eight-year-olds or, uh, you know, special ed kids with Down syndrome. Um, some little bit of this is what we're going to focus on today or what you're going to learn by working with the dogs today, what, you know, some little nugget of information. And then it goes into uh, grooming. So all the students in classes, depend, regardless of you know, what kind of class they are, will sit down with their individual dog and they do brushing teeth and, uh, and brushing coats. And what that does is calm all, there are no more than 10 kids in each class, I should say. So that's, uh, you know, the kind of um, the tipping point for management of dogs and, and student trainers together. But they all sit down individually and groom their dogs, and so it calms everybody and it starts and it sets up that bond between student trainer and dog. And then after they do their little grooming piece, and if you could watch eight-year-olds, you know, brushing dogs' teeth, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I mean, you just get like the biggest giggles out of a lot of these things and, you know, taking it very seriously. And in the beginning of any of these classes, we work in Boys and Girls Club and we work with some um, economically and I'm going to say, you know, socially challenged kids. And when you look at, you know, it, here in New Mexico um, with our um, Hispanic and, and Native American population, culturally, there is a different relationship with the dog. And so to watch these kids who, you know, uh, a pit bull chained to a fence might be the neighborhood dog. I'm not sticking my hand in that dog's mouth, and you know, and and the learning that takes place in each of these simple activities is just phenomenal. And they and each one of these kids then become, you know, ambassadors for the working dog, for the value of the dog in today's um, in today's environment, which is really really amazing. Then they go into yeah. whatever the you know the command that they're going to be working on for the day. So well, I mean, the benefits of this, Carolyn, is just. Like you said, I mean, you touched on quite a few things of what all these kids are learning, not only what they're contributing in getting these dogs prepared for a life of service to the people with disabilities, but also the social implications of this, of how you're changing their knowledge and their understanding and relationships with animals. It's just the coolest thing. So I, well, we're going to take a quick break and hear some messages from our sponsors, and we're going to come back and continue visiting with Carolyn about Assistance Dogs of the West. I've got a lot more questions for you about the cool work that you guys are doing and just can't wait to hear more. So listen to these important messages from our sponsors and come right back. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Greetings, human. What planet am I on? Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in paparazzi, candid pictures of you and your pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No, to my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. This valuable information comes from your pet. There's nothing like a wagging tail or friendly paw to lift your mood. They're therapeutic and make us feel good. Studies show pets even reduce stress, prevent heart disease, lower blood pressure, and fight depression. So there you have it. Pets are a daily dose of good health and happiness. Pets add life. To learn more, visit petsadlife.org. Thinking about buying a monkey? How about a ferret or a skunk? Then check out the show that will answer the burning questions, where do you get them? What do you feed them? How do you take care of them? And most of all, what were you thinking? With exotic pet expert and author Bob Tart, every week on demand from PetLifeRadio.com. Let's 
Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. And today we're talking with Carolyn Clark Beadle from Assistance Dogs of the West. And Carolyn, you've been telling us about these really cool student programs that, that your program is implementing. And I just have to ask you, how do you fund these programs? Uh, thanks for asking. Our, uh, it's, we're a nonprofit. And the, um, our annual operating budget, and I just say this because it's an interesting, you know, kind of number in the world today uh, to keep uh, we've got about seven or eight um, staff members that are the instructor trainers and you know program support people we've got two admin people that make this happen which is I mean myself and another person working like not like dogs <laughs> <We're> working <laughs> like I don't even know what like you know uh, ants in an anthill but the annual operating budget is about $600,000, which means we look for $50,000 a month to keep all this going. That's keeping the 18 programs going. We've got between 30 and 35 dogs in training each year. We make about 15 placements, and everybody who works with dogs know, you know, we've got little dogs, puppies coming in, and two-year-olds going out, so it's a constant cycle of how many can we place. Um, and we have about 35 to 40 clients on our wait list. So our wait list might be anywhere from six months to two years, depending on on what the client needs are and depending on how many dogs are ready to go at that particular in that particular year but we make um, about 25% of that money from earned income so if we're teaching and we look for schools that ho- and or agencies that hopefully will pay us to have the program that's not a hundred percent so maybe 50% of our programs pay and 50% we fundraise for. Um, so 25% of that big number comes from those earned income fees. Uh, about 35% comes from foundation grants and corporate you know, foundations and, and community um, uh, funding kind of endowment, things like that. And then about 40%, and this is each year, that's kind of how the pie is cut up, about 40% come from individual donors. And individual donors give every, everywhere, and I want to say this honestly, in today's world, give everywhere from $5 to $50,000, which is just amazing because there are the $5 givers that give you know, every month or give every year, and they are as important to us as the $50,000 donors who you know, give you the one-time shot. It's astounding to see the great support that we receive from people mostly in our community, but, but across the country as well. Well, you mentioned that Today Show um, program that focused on the um, disability trainers or people with disabilities who were training. And out of that, we got some great supporters ac- from across the country. One man sends us dog treats that he makes. He sends us boxes of dog treats every month and has for four years. Oh, that's so, so cool. Well, I know people always say, oh, I don't have any money. I can't mm. contribute. But I love that you're saying that the $5 donors are just as important um, for your sustainability and for your long-term services as the people who can write a huge check of $50,000. And there's so many different things that people can do, like making treats. You know, there's always some way that people can contribute. So I love that, that you guys are really a grassroots organization that really – appreciates all of those different contributions. So let's talk a little bit more about Assistance Dogs of the West and, and how people can apply for a dog. What is that process like? Uh, we have, when you ask that question, I'm, I'm reminded to say that we also, because we place dogs with lots of different kinds of disabilities, we have um, a fairly a uh, fairly rigorous application process. So I want to say it, it, the types of dogs that we place, uh, we started out with physical mobility assistance dogs, which was the standard. And just like I said, uh, how our organization is, we like to try new things and we like to learn constantly. So when someone in the state of New Mexico, 80% of our dogs are placed in the state of New Mexico. Um, when someone came to us and said, you know, I really, I have a seizure disorder. And I, you know, can your dog help me? And we know that dogs can help with people with seizure disorders. So we started working on training specifically for uh, dogs to help people with seizure disorders. And the rise of autism in our uh, in our 
total culture is frightening and there's so many children that are um, that have autism and dogs can help really well with that um, particular challenge so we place dogs with children with autism and that ends up being a family placement because the child who may be five years old is not going to be the handler someone in the um, caregiving environment mom dad is going to be the handler primarily and working with the, the child and the dog uh, we place dogs with people with psychiatric disorders so clinical depression or panic anxiety agoraphobia I'm afraid to go outside uh, there are lots of different um, psychiatric challenges that service dogs can help out with and that turns into PTSD the um, post-traumatic stress disorder that a lot of veterans are coming back with um, so we're working with the veteran community and and dogs to help with with those challenges um, we're also working with uh, medical alert dogs that are helping specifically with the, uh, people with diabetes. So when your blood sugar drops, there's a scent change, and dogs can be alert alert to that. So by virtue of doing all these different kinds of dogs, um, we get a lot of calls from people. And the more that people hear about us, the more um, stringent kind of, and I don't mean it to be difficult, but to say, you know, we want to make sure that people that come through the door and ask for our services, that we are going to be able to help, that our dogs will be able to help them. So clients fill out a, an application and they provide a number of references, medical and personal, and they go through an occupational therapist needs evaluation. Once again, we're looking at what do you really need help with and can our dogs help you? you know, improve your life. After they go through, provide all of this information, we have a client review where we all sit down, the staff sits down and says, okay, you know, knowing what we know about this individual, can our dogs help them? If they pass that filter, then they're in our client wait list. Clients on our wait list start interviewing with dogs that are potential placements. And a client at Assistant Dogs of the West can go through anywhere from eight interviews and those would be like 90 minute sessions where the the client and the dog and the staff member are you know kind of assessing can you talk to that dog is that dog responding to you you know what what are we looking like uh in out in public you know what are the needs and, and are they being met kind of sort of um it could be anywhere from eight to i am not kidding you some people have gone through 25 interviews and it, it'll start with three or four dogs and then it'll start, we winnow it down and you get into a match. When you see the, the, the match happen, it's magic. And I'm going to say, I, I, you can't even describe all of a sudden a dog with an individual. And the only thing I can say is like the dog looks at the person and goes, well, that's kind of cool. I want to hang around with you. <laughs> yeah. You honestly yeah. see, you see it. <laughs> I know. I mean, I've had that experience three times now, and it, it is nothing short of magic. It, it reminds yeah. me of like the little fairy dust, you know, being sprayed, and it's just, it's amazing. It's such it's a, a connection. Yeah, it is. It's wonderful to watch. So then, so when that match is made, and I mentioned earlier that all the dogs are trained to a standard of 90 commands, when the match is made, if the person is the young child with autism, then we sit and say, okay, so family, you know, what specific, you know, uh, commands or resources would you like that dog to be able to provide for you? And if I go with the autism example, um, lots of children with autism have a darting response where they'll run off. And so how do we brace? How do we make sure that the dog, what if, you know, if child has started to descend into, you know, a, a highly anxious state, go get mom. So, you know, it, it, what, what's the go-get person and how are we going to do that? So those are examples of how we finish the dog. And then when the dog is completely finished, there is a two-week client placement training uh, workshop that takes place here in Santa Fe. And the client team, if that's what it is, come in. And for the first week, they learn all the commands and how to work with the dog. Well, they learn all about dog mind and how dogs think. And they learn about, you know, taking care of and health and safety, et cetera, et cetera. And then they take the public access certification test, which is do handler and dog, can they, um, you know, uh, demonstrate the behaviors that we want to see out in public so that there will not be a question with any kind of public access, which we know sometimes is an issue. Well, it sounds like you really engage your clients really all throughout the whole process. Truly we do. And the, once again, the intention is make the, you know, 
uh, set the foundation for the best relationship ongoing. As you know, having gone through you know three relationships, it they're more successful. Clearly, the more that they know, and the more that um, the more resources that are be are applied. Absolutely, I know because when I got my first service dog, I didn't know anything about dogs, and all the things that you've been mentioning are just so important, like learning how to groom your dog, learning how to read your dog, learning how to really make that connection, and it takes time and hard work. You know what? Thank you for saying that because that's another thing. I we totally celebrate the client. Uh, who goes through, I mean, if we're working really hard to get those dogs to that place and those dogs work really hard to learn all, and enjoy it, you know, learn all their commands and learn that. Clients work so hard to, you know, get to that place of being able to access all of the support that their service dog can offer them. And it's a monumental feat. It really is. It is, and that's what I tell people. I'm like, you know, you see these dogs and you see them work with their trainers and they just look like they do everything every single time, but <laughs> you have to build that trust with that dog. You have to put in the time and effort and building that relationship, and that's what I think people, a lot of people don't seem to quite grasp of really the time and energy and effort and commitment that it takes on both team members exactly. in order to have a yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you're asking that thing about you know the whole the client you know evaluation that we we look for that as well, students self select as well as clients because if you don't have the just as you're pointing out if you don't have the energy or the commitment to be able to get there it's not going to be successful so there's no point in you know kind of wasting resources. Right. One other thing I would say uh, something else that we do that that some organizations do and we're really pleased to be able to offer it as a service is we do owner self training. So if you had a uh, if you had a disability and you had your own dog and you really wanted to train your own dog and not wait to get one of uh, assistance dogs or the West dogs, you can go through the whole application process. So we, you know, we assess the client needs and determine that yes, indeed, you know, a service dog can help you out. And then your dog goes through an evaluation process as well. Because not all dogs, as we know, can be service dogs. They may not, you know, they might have some kind of temperament or behavioral characteristic that does, it won't allow them to be successful. But if we think that your dog, you know, passes the evaluation and can be a successful service dog, then clients as owner self-trainers go through a minimum of a nine-month training. They come in for two hours once a week, learn, you know, commands and behaviors, and then go home and practice it and come back again until they get to that place where they can pass the public access certification and they have their dog trained to provide the resources that they would like. And that's another really wonderful thing to see because then you're getting dogs from all, I mean, like lots of different breeds that are not the standards of our industry. That's That's awesome. And how much does it cost to participate in that program for an owner if they want to be an owner self-trainer participant? All of our client fees are uh, the same, regardless of whether you're getting a dog, because you're not buying a dog from Assistance Dogs of the West when you uh, when you um, kind of enroll in our program. What you're paying for are the services that we're providing. So there's a one-time client fee of $3,500 for any of the programs that we work with. And uh, what I'll say is it costs us probably about $15,000 to train a service dog, one of ours. It costs us probably about $5,000 worth of services to the client but because uh, you know clients with disabilities generally have financial challenges as well uh, we have we have frozen it at $3,500 for the moment and I say that for the moment we'd love to keep it that way um, but in today's economic environment it's also it's so challenging to keep finding the money to keep it going but you know in for the foreseeable future that is the one-time fee well and I have to say that seems pretty low for all the different services and all the assistance that you're giving people whether they want a dog trained by you or if they want you to help them train their dog that's pretty low and you guys also work with individuals to help them raise that money if they have some financial challenges is that true that is true. We have um, we have a fundraising package that goes out to all the clients with a whole bunch of suggestions about ways to raise money. We have clients that have been 
enormously clever and creative in ways of, you know, raising that money. So we, you know, we have taken those clever ideas and thrown them into the package and say, you know, think about this, think about that. We also fundraise from different agencies, hopefully to put money into a client scholarship fund so that if people come to us with severe financial challenges and are really having a hard time, we hope that we will have, you know, enough money to help them out with uh, uh, with client scholarships. And I'll say that um, for the U.S. vets that are coming back, everybody wants to help. And if a, if a veteran needs a dog, we are um, we are funding those completely through you know beg, borrow, steal, scholarshiping. Well, that's so wonderful, Carolyn. Well, I am so sorry that we're out of time because we could just keep talking on and on about all the amazing programs that you have and all of the different people with disabilities that you're serving. So I just thank you so much for coming on and being our guest today, and I hope you'll come back. I would love to, and I want to say, Marcy, thank you so very much because what you do is great in helping people understand what dogs can do in today's environment is just it helps the world be a better place well thank you and and i really encourage our listeners to check out your website and what's that web address carolyn it's www.assistancedogsofthewest all spelled out dot org okay great and is there a phone number in case our listeners want to contact assistance dogs of the west directly if anyone wants to call us you are welcome to at 505-986 9748. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to all of our listeners for joining us. And Whistle and I hope that you'll come back and join us again um, working like dogs at petliferadio.com. Thanks so much, and take good care. Let's Talk Pets every week on demand, only on petliferadio.com. <laughs>